In this video, I'll be showing you how to make your images look awesome on the web and social media. Hi there, Michael Volshinovich here from Vibrant Shot. You can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash vibrantshot and also at vibrantshot.com. So in this video, we're going to be looking at something that I get asked about a lot, and that is how do I process my images for output to the web or social media? So we're going to cover off things like sharpening, what the best resolution is, uh, how to add noise, watermarks, all that kind of stuff. So we're starting off in Lightroom, but it's not necessary that you have Lightroom. You can use Aperture or whatever other uh, software you use to manage your collection. In this case, we're just going to be using Lightroom to actually get our image from its uh, raw format into TIFF. So before we actually export our images, um, just make sure that you specify your copyright data uh, on your file, because once you export it, it's good to have that information there in case somebody finds your image on the web wants to figure out how to get in contact with you, at least that information is buried in the metadata. So once you've got your um, copyright information put in here, just select the images that you want to actually export to the web and go to File, Export. And then from here, uh, I tend to put them all into one folder called Export, but you know, entirely up to you where you end up putting those. Again, naming, it's up to you how you want to name your files. I just leave them as the default names that are coming out of camera. For the file settings, make sure that you have TIFF as your image format, uh, sRGB as your color space, and 8-bit uh, depth on the color. Don't bother with 16-bit because ultimately we're going to be converting to a JPEG, which is going to be 8-bit anyways. Finally, down at the bottom here, just make sure that um, you are including copyright and contact info only. Um, feel free to export all metadata, but generally I don't like to include the camera information and all that kind of stuff, uh, but I do want to export the copyright and contact info, so just have that selected. So we're going to hit export. That's going to start exporting our files to TIFF. Now I already have those files open in Photoshop, so we're actually going to start working on them. So we'll start off with this portrait, and basically my main goal with the portraits is to retain the texture that I have in the image in the first place. So if we actually zoom in here, we see that there is a lot of texture in the face, and obviously we worked hard to maintain that texture as we retouch, so last thing we want to do is lose it all after we shrink our file down. So basically when it comes to uh, anything for social media, I always export at 2048 pixels on the long edge. So in a portrait, that's going to be your height. And of course, on a landscape image, that'll be your width. For your website, obviously, it depends on how your website is structured. But generally, um, you know, anywhere between 1200 and 1500 pixels on the long edge is pretty good for a website. But for social media, always 2048. And that will make it look best, especially in Facebook. So for this image here, we're going to go into image, image size, and I'm going to specify 2048 as my height. Now at this point, it depends on what version of Photoshop you're using. If you're in Photoshop CC, they added this um, preserve details option, and that's actually their intelligent upsampling algorithm, which actually allows you to increase the size of their files, uh, or increase the size of your file, uh, in a fairly intelligent and high quality manner. But um, what I found is it actually works really well when you're downsampling as well. And so uh, when you're downsampling, though, just make sure that you have reduced noise turned down to zero because we're obviously not creating any noise when we're downsampling because, uh, well, we're, we're shrinking the image. We're not enlarging the image. So click OK there. And that is going to resize our image to 2048. And if we zoom in here, even at 200 percent, we see that there is a lot of nice texture still in the image. So. When using Photoshop CC and the Preserve um, Details option, you basically don't need to sharpen any further from here, uh, provided your image was fairly sharp uh, to begin with in the original file. So at this point, we can pretty much stop and proceed to the next step. But what I'm going to do is actually step back and show you what you would do if, um, if, of course, you don't have Photoshop CC and you need to use another approach. So without Photoshop CC, we're going to go still go to Image Size, put in 2048 as our height, and then from here, instead of choosing Preserve Details, we're going to pick Bicubic Smoother. And in this case, uh, Bicubic Smoother is your best bet just because if you pick any of these other options, um, it is going to make your image overly sharpened. You're going to get too much uh, texture and sort of crunchiness in there, and it just doesn't look good for a portrait. So Bicubic Smoother as your downsampling option. 
click OK. And now if we zoom in to 200% here, if you kind of recall how the image looked um, using the preserve details option, we had a lot more texture in the face. It looked a lot better. So unfortunately, you know, it's not going to look as good as it would if we had preserved details in Photoshop CC. But what we can do to kind of work around this is to duplicate our layer using Command J or Control J. Then we're going to go into Image, Adjustments, and Brightness Contrast. Select Use Legacy and go down to minus 50. From here, go into Filter, Other, High Pass. And you're basically going to select a pixel radius that is still going to show the texture on the face. So right now it looks like about 1.1 1, 1 .1 pixels is going to work pretty well. From here you're going to select the overlay blend mode. And either of the other blend modes are going to get a little too much sharpness in your image. And now if we kind of toggle that on and off, we see that texture starting to come back. Now when I'm using the high pass layer, what I'll typically do is actually create an inverted mask. So holding down Option or Alt, hit the mask key and then I'll actually brush in areas where I want to see that texture again. So, um, you know, generally that's going to be anywhere on the face that um, has texture. So a lot of areas we don't actually want to include that in, in which case there's no point in actually sharpening them or, or making them feel over sharpened, just the areas that we need in particular. So in this case, because we're using very shallow depth of field, uh, the only areas that are really in focus are parts of the cheek and in the hair. And I think the hair is okay to begin with. So basically this is pretty much where I would stop in terms of sharpening. We can always, of course, play with the opacity as needed if you find that it's still feeling a little bit too sharp. So now, um, regardless of whether you use the preserve details uh, mode or the bicubic smoother mode, I usually tend to add some noise to my portraits as well. Um, you can add generally less noise if you have the preserve details because it already looks pretty good and sharp. But with the bicubic smoother, sometimes we want to add that noise to, again, make it look like there's more texture in there uh, and kind of recover some of the texture that we've lost. So a couple of ways that you can add texture. Uh, basically, I start off with a new layer, hit Shift F5 or Function Shift F5 if you're on a Mac laptop. Sometimes you have to hold down that function key. Have uh, Use 50% Gray selected and click OK. That's going to fill that layer of 50% Gray. And what you can do is go to Filter, um, Noise, and Add Noise. From here, I would add anywhere between 3 to 8% noise, depending on uh, if you have a color or black and white image. For color, 3% is usually pretty good. For black and white, um, you can go as high as 8%, but I generally wouldn't go over that. So usually I'm adding about 3%, uh, make sure it's uniform and monochromatic. Now that's one option. Uh, the other option, which I actually prefer nowadays, is to go into Filter, Filter Gallery. And if Filter Gallery is not enabled for you, just make sure that you are in... 8-bit mode, not 16-bit mode. Uh, the filter gallery doesn't work for 16-bit, so that's why it, it might not be showing up for you. So if we go into filter gallery, there is a filter in there in the artistic section called film grain. So just select that and have your values around 4, 6, and 10. So with those selected, click OK. That's going to generate some grain for us. And then we're going to blend this with overlay blend mode. And that basically is going to make the actual image show through. So now again, I'm going to go to 200%, and if we look at this, it's obviously like way too grainy. It's not looking too good, um, so we would never use this much grain in our image. So first thing I want to do is make sure to constrain my grain to just more or less the mid-tones of the image, because naturally when grain appears in film, that's kind of generally where you're going to see it. So we're going to double-click on that layer, and first thing we're going to do is drag our uh, shadow slider in our blend if down a little bit, and we're going to drag our highlight slider down a bit, and holding down Option or Alt, we're going to split the sliders and kind of drag them into the middle here. So make sure you have Option or Alt selected to uh, create that split there. If we click OK and we kind of toggle between the before and the after, you can see in the before we have all this noise in the shadows. We have it right in the eyes, but in the after we kind of get rid of it from the eyes and get rid of it from the shadows. And we're just kind of retaining it in um, the mid-tones of our image. So that's really what we want. And now obviously it's still way too much noise for my liking, so I'm going to scale this back until I'm happy with it. And in this case, around 40, 45% probably looks pretty good. So uh, toggling that on and off, again, just verifying that it actually makes a difference. And you know, you can see that it's, um, it's adding a little something to the image. It looks like some of that texture is actually uh, coming back through. So I'm happy with 45%. Again, just verify at 100 that it does look good. And I think it does. So we're basically ready at this point to 
save our image. So just go into File, Save for Web. From here, pick a quality level of 95. Uh, I don't like to go lower because I'm going to show you a third-party uh, plugin or essentially a separate application that you can use to reduce the size of your JPEG but still retain a good amount of quality. So I tend to always leave this at 95. Image size will obviously stay at 2048. You're not going to be changing that. And um, just make sure that metadata, copyright, and contact info is selected. So I'm going to save that as portrait. And now we can move on to our architecture image. So when it comes to architecture and landscape images, it's generally the same process as with a portrait, but we don't really have to worry about whether or not we have Photoshop CC or another version, because we're always going to be using the bicubic smoother option to downsample our image. So we're going to repeat the same process, essentially going into image, image size, typing in 2048 as our width. Bicubic Smoother is going to be selected. And the reason I always use Bicubic Smoother is because I find with architecture and landscape images, it's very easy to bring that sharpness and detail back. Whereas with uh, portraits, it's a little bit harder to get that skin texture looking good when you resharpen the image. So Bicubic Smoother gives us the most control because then we can obviously control the amount of sharpening that we're going to be applying um, once we're done our resize. So we have our image here at 100%. I'm going to hit Command or Control J to duplicate that layer. And we're just going to go to Filter, Sharpen, Smart Sharpen. From here, I'm going to pick 200% as my amount, 0.2 pixels as my radius. If you're outputting to your website at around 1,300, 1,500 pixels, uh, you may want to lower that radius down to about 0.1 px. So clicking OK there, we see if we toggle that on and off, what a difference the Smart Sharpening actually makes. All of the detail in these bricks starts to come out as well as all these little textures here. So that's already looking pretty good, but I find that we as humans always tend to overdo things. So I naturally lower down my sharpen layer to around 70, 75%, just because I, if I think it looks good now, it's probably a little too sharp. So, you know, I always find I kick myself afterwards for saying, yeah, I should have taken that back a little bit. So usually 70, 75% uh, will give you a pretty good result in the end there. So once we have that sharpened, uh, now if you find that it's still looking a little bit crunchy, uh, you can also experiment with a darken or lighten blend mode to see uh, if that produces a result that is still sharp but a little bit less um, crunchy. But in this case, normal blend mode works just fine. Now when it comes to landscape and architecture images, I do like to throw in a watermark just because I find they get passed around the net a lot more than a portrait does. Um, I also find it really distracting when you have a watermark in portraits, so uh, I basically put them into the architecture images so that if they get posted somewhere and somebody likes the image, they can easily find me and uh, inquire about the image. So I don't expect that it will protect me fully, but it's, um, it's a helpful thing to put in. So I'm going to grab my watermark, just drag it up into my image. And generally what I try and do when watermarking uh, architecture or landscape images is to find a place that is not too obtrusive. So smack dab in the middle here is probably not where I would put it. Uh, in fact, uh, I wouldn't put it anywhere kind of along this, this center point here. I'll try and find somewhere in the quadrants here to actually put it in. Now I try not to get it too close to the corners because then it can be cropped off for the most part. And I also try not to put it in areas that are um, very clear. So for example, you know, a clear piece of sky, uh, if you put a watermark there, somebody can easily open it up in Photoshop, content aware fill it, and it's gone in five seconds. So I'm looking for a place that has a little bit of texture uh, that will make it, you know, somewhat difficult to remove, but uh, of course it's, it's never foolproof. In the case of this image, it's a little bit hard because anywhere I put it here is not really going to look very good. So I'm reduced to using this corner space over here and I can just shrink my, um, actual graphic down a little bit and then let me just rasterize this shape here now one thing I like to do uh, with my watermarks is to try a couple of different blend modes here just to see whether or not that integrates a little bit more smoothly and in this case as you can see applying an overlay blend mode makes it kind of look like that watermark is being projected up into that stone so it's it's kind of becomes part of the image as opposed to this really obtrusive ugly thing that we add Another thing you can do is just hit Command T and, um, for example, warp or perspective that into place so that it, again, just looks like it's um, being projected into that particular area of the image. So now that we have that, we're ready to export the image again. So File, Save for Web. And notice I did not add any noise. Um, you can. I generally don't add noise to architecture or landscape images. But again, if it's a black and white, it can sometimes look nice. So you can just repeat the same process that we used for the portraits. 
Now from here, we're exporting again a 95 quality. Um, don't go below that because again, uh, the, the plugin that we're gonna use is actually gonna reduce the size of our uh, JPEG quite drastically. So we wanna keep it at 95. Everything else is the same, size doesn't change and metadata, uh, copyright and contact info. So hit save there, type in, we'll call this arc. Okay. And now what we're gonna do is going into our folder with our two JPEGs, we're going to open up an application called JPEG Mini. Now, this is a free application. Uh, the free version allows you to convert up to 20 images a day. Um, so I've been using the free version, and it's been working really well for me. Um, I'll probably end up getting the, the paid version just because it's, it's a really great little app to have. And basically what it does is it takes uh, the JPEG, shrinks it down to still a web-friendly format that will work anywhere on the web, um, but basically it reduces the size quite drastically without actually affecting the image quality. Um, what I find is if you export at 95, uh, quality level and you bring it in here it reduces the file size down to somewhere the equivalent of like a 75 80 quality level but still retains the quality so don't go 80 in the quality level there because if you export it at 80 you'll have a lower image quality but then bringing it into JPEG mini it won't actually change the file size anymore so better to output at a higher level in Photoshop and then bring into here so basically you're just going to drag in the images that you want to reduce that's going to shrink your images down and in this case we saved 2.3 megabytes and it reduces it by about 2.3 times so it makes a pretty drastic difference especially for your website which you want to load as fast as possible for social media it's not necessary because ultimately um, every social media application is doing its own uh, level of conversion on that image anyways so i hope you found that useful um, basically those are the steps that i take anytime i'm putting an image on facebook google plus 500 px or my website and um, hopefully it helps to improve the quality of your images on social media as well. So until next time, uh, be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel below. we got a lot of great videos that are going to be coming out soon. Um, and also hit us up on Facebook at facebook.com slash vibrantshot. Bye for now.